Good evening. Welcome to uh, Keystone Montessori's Parent Education Night. My name is Patrick McGlinchey. I'm the Director of Programs here at Keystone. Today we're going to talk about uh, two topics. We're going to talk about the practical life area. Mrs. Achala from the Oak Room will be giving that a, a conversation. Oh, recording in progress. And then we're going to uh, go into Birch Room to Katie Ottinger, who's our new teacher, and she's going to talk to us about language in the Montessori classroom. I'd like to go over a couple housekeeping things before we start. I would ask that everybody please make sure you're on mute. Please know that we are going to record this. Also know that if you have questions at the end of Mrs. Vichala's uh, presentation, there will be a chance to ask a couple of questions about practical life. And then when we get into the language area, after Katie gives her explanation and, and presentation, we'll also be able to ask some questions. So I'm gonna ask that you hold off on your questions until the end of each presentation. If you're having trouble, remember, if you're a little worried about having uh, remembering your question, you can always put it in the chat and hopefully we'll get to that as well, okay? So, thank you all for making the, the trip to your computer and coming to see us tonight. I think we're gonna have some uh, good, good uh, uh, presentations from our teachers. And I'm hoping that it'll give you some insight as to what's going on in our classroom. Again, please stay on mute until the end of each presentation. And if you have a question, we'll be happy to answer them. Other than that, please sit back and enjoy. I'm gonna introduce you to my good friend, Prabha Bachar. Good evening again. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Mr. McGlinchey, who are always there for all of us. Um, as Mr. McGlinchey said, that we'll start with the practical life area. In our Montessori environment, practical life area is always the beginning. And it's the most important area in our uh, environment because it's uh, specifically designed to meet your child's physical, emotional, uh, intellectual, social, and academic sometimes. It's also spiritual needs. So all these activities you are seeing on the shelf uh, helps the children to develop their concentration, coordination, independence, and order. You might be wondering what are those. Before the children do the uh, actual math and language, it's very important to develop these skills. So the direct object of this practical life area is for the children to develop the concentration, coordination, independence, and order. So throughout the night, you might hear these buzzwords. We call it a CCIO. Uh, and uh, the indirect uh, uh, aim is, of course, the task itself. So for example, when the children are doing a pouring work, uh, not only they're developing their fine motor skill, hand-eye coordination, they're also developing their independent skills how to pour the juice, how to pour the milk, how to take the water in the pitcher. So all these things is especially helping them to have the independent living skills. Um, so when we give the lessons to the children or when we put the materials on the shelf, we always follow a sequence. The sequence is again very important because it helps them for the reading and writing. Uh, for example, when we put the materials on the shelf, the first thing we do is always show them the simple activities. So here, this year is a little bit hard because we're doing from home. Um, usually we move, but if I move, you won't be able to see. But I just wanted to show you um, when we do the scooping activity, for example, we always start with the hand um, and then we go to the tool. Uh, so that's the sequence. And when we do it, it's, it's from left to right and top to bottom and simple to complex. Those are the sequence we follow. Um, left to right is basically help them for reading. So, for example, when we read, we always read from left to right. And then when we say top to bottom, uh, it's also helping them for the preparation of writing. When they write the number or the letters, we always start. For example, number five starts from top to bottom. 
or the letters um, top to bottom. So top to bottom, left to right, and simple to complex also. We always introduce the simple materials first, simple activity, because again, we want the child to be very in successful and uh, we don't want the child to get frustrated by taking a very advanced material. Um, so, and when we also arrange the materials on the shelf, we follow the same sequence. Input to complex, top to bottom, left to right, dry to wet. For example, when I was saying the pouring work, we always introduce the dry pouring first. It's easy because it spills, easy to clean up. And then we go to the wet. So dry to wet is the another sequence we follow. So, so uh, and then the last one is the concrete to abstract, of course. Abstract, it only comes after six year old. So when they go to elementary, they're all in prepared in our preschool, in our children's house, and then we go to elementary. So, and the same thing when we give the lessons to the children also, we follow the same sequence. So tonight I'll show you some of the um, I'll do some presentation and then I'll go more in, in depth into that. And also, all these materials are seen with on the shelf. I hope you're able to see it. If not, um, I it wish we could be all here. <laughs> but uh, we are in Sita according to um, the difficulty level. Uh, all these materials are prepared by the teacher. I think these things are not where we can get it in any store, in any Montessori or not. Because depending on the child's ability and the teacher's observation and the child's need, the teachers make these materials. Uh, for example, if a child loves to do squeezing or loves to do pouring, we see if the child is squeezing from one side or squeezing the sound, that they look for say, hmm, there is a need for this child to do this work. So the next day, we make a material, put it on the shelf, and we uh, ask the child to invite the child. So when we give a lesson to the child, we follow a work cycle. The first um, work cycle is we always invite the child. Because yes, these materials are beautiful. I work very hard to make them. It may not be um, very intuitive to the child. Uh, so we always invite the child. We say, hey, yesterday you were squeezing some of my hand or squeezing this one. Today there is a beautiful material on the shelf if you like to see. And then we invite the child. So that the child will know where the material is on the shelf. And then we ask, would you like to do this? 99% of the time, the child says yes. And if the child says no, I said, okay, thank you for coming and seeing that. But most of the time, even if that child is not another child, so there's a need for the child to do that. So, and then we will say that, okay, let's take that. This work, the name of the work we tell them is going to be a table work or a round work. So always we tell them whether the image work should be table work or table work. If it's a table work, we show them how to carry it and then put it on the table. And then the second cycle. So the work cycle has three steps. First, we invite the child. Second step is presentation of the um, material or uh, the activity. So when we present the activity to the child, we always take the child's dominant side. That means the child's right hand side because we want the child to see our hand movement, not my lips. And we always give the lesson in absolute silence, especially all the materials in the practical health area. When we give the lesson, we always do in silence. Of course, in language and sensory and science, then we can use the vocabulary, we use the uh, words. But in practical life, we want them to see our hand movement because remember, this is for the hand-eye coordination. So if I talk, they'll watch my mouth, they won't watch my hand, that's why. So we do in silence, but once in a while, we also make eye contact with the child to make sure the child is paying the attention. If the child is not paying the attention, it's not the child's fault. It's the teacher's. Maybe I'm doing it too fast, or maybe it's too complex for the child. So absolutely silently, we do it. Once in a while, we just make the eye contact, and after we finish the child, we thank the child. We appreciate the child for the patience to sit and watch. We say, thank you for watching my lesson. And sometimes we say, would you like to try? And when the child tries, um, 
the way I showed it, he might do, or maybe he will do it in a different way. We never interrupt a child. If the child does it differently or does it something, that means that is a clue to me that I must have given the lesson a little bit faster. I must have done something. So the next day, again, we give the same lesson by observing what the child was not doing properly the way we wanted, and we follow. Sometimes if the child does his, his way or own, her own way, it's okay because that's how they learn the practice makes the person perfect. So they keep on doing it. Um, uh, so that's how the, mm. the presentation But The third step, like I said, the work cycle has three steps to my present. Third step is to put the work back on the shelf. That is the hardest one for all of us. Even as an adult, we are still learning. How many times when we bake the cake or something, oh, we get excited, we do everything, but Clean up is the hardest part. So a lot of children spend a lot of time uh, and it's okay to spend it for days and rows of days to do everything in that because that is the last step um, for anything. So that's that's how we give the lessons and that's the work cycle. Um, I think I have talked too much. Uh, I know you must be now. Uh, wanted to see how we give the presentation to the children. So basically our practical life area is divided into four um, areas. Um, uh, so first area is called primary movements or body management. And the second area is the grace and courtesy uh, that where the children learn the social skill. Uh, and the third is the care of the person where they learn the independent living skill by uh, buttoning their shirt or tying their shoes. And the fourth area is the care of the environment where they uh, learn to respect the environment, not only the environment, but the, the living and other non-living things. So I'm going to show you the first uh, area. I'm going to stand and try to bend so that you'll be able to see. Uh, so the first is, uh, as soon as the children start, actually we spend a lot of time in the beginning of the year um, by teaching them a lot of body management skills. Uh, because up until now, the children knows how to walk, how to run, and how to climb up and down. But here, we teach them to refine their movement. For example, sometimes uh, the children have to, most of the time, um, big, big work in the classroom, they use a rug. So we tell them how to hold a rug and walk around. So if they hold the rug up onto the up on the chin, they won't be able to see and they will be bump and they'll watch it. Hmm, all this carry the rug, this will walk. And then we show them how to roll and unroll. All this and sometimes some children on uh, we also teach them a song to get their attention. Um, like roll, roll, roll your rug, but the children are going home and singing that is what they are teaching. And then after we roll the rug, we put it back. So that's the simple body management. As I said before, we start with the simple activities. And then another body management also a little bit complex. You have to hold a blow and walk around the circle or walk on the line. It's a little complex again. We want the child to be successful. The carrying the rug is easy. It's a little bit harder because they're using both the hands, not the whole. And that gets a little complex. Mm, carrying the scissors, sharp objects. When we carry a sharp objects, we have to be very careful. So that's a little bit gets complex. Then more complex is carrying the bag. We know our friends are working. We don't want to interrupt our friends. So you have to be careful not to make the noise and walk. That's that's a little challenging. So here the concentration is increasing. They have to and and like coordination, three things they do. Mm -hmm. More complex work, but plenty. I mean, I just have three four here. The children also they put a um, apron or some line, and they have to hold a spoon and a marker, which is really a sphere, and they have to walk. It's an ultimate concentration, coordination, everything is an 
this is where I say that uh, the practical life sometimes teaches them the spirituality also. What happens is when we know if a child and if 50% of our children have done this work, we know they're ready for this to do the silent scheme. So Mar Maria Montessori actually believed in uh, that the ch children have the spiritual and grow and then we have to uh, nurture the spiritual nature also because they're all born with the innocence. So we have to touch their innocence, their heart. So we do a silence also. So the body management starts from the simple thing, goes to the spirituality. And you will stop because I'm a very spiritual person. I don't want to go through that. So the next one is called the primary movements. That's where the scooping and spooning. We have seven primary movements actually. First one is the scooping. Again, a simple thing starts with both the hands, then one hand and then the finger. So they are developing their, um, strengthening their hand muscle skills. So first they use the hand and then the two instruments. Then we use the spooning. Again, the lab spooning. Spooning. If this, this one is just from one container to another container, the large one, very easy. Anyone can do it. But then it gets complicated. One too many. This one has two, and it has two colors. So blue goes here, and then white goes here. A little complex. So they have to think here. So the thinking process also happens here. And then comes the tiny spoon. This one is going to get more complex because they are red, green, blue, red, green, blue. And then there are two, two in each hole it goes. So this is just an example again, simple to complex. Um, so there are seven primary movements. One is the scooping, and then comes the twisting, uh, and then, sorry, scooping. Uh, yes, we yeah. have scooping, twisting, and then comes grasping and controlling, which is the pouring work, and then comes the after the pouring comes stringing and then folding and stringing and pounding. Sorry. I'm <laughs> um, today I'm going to show you a, a beautiful work about the squeezing. Again, the squeezing, when we show them the squeezing, first comes with the, sorry, I have to move, with the two hands squeezing the sponge and then comes one hand squeezing the wet squeezing and the complex squeezing. And then then the tools, the plenty of activities to do. One of the activities just in the primary movement, I'll give you a demo. This one is, is a squeezing activity using the hand, but the length of this activity is almost takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, here, I have to do it very silently. So we invite the child, the child will sit on to my left hand side, so his dominant side. And another thing is before we give this, we, we have to make sure the child already has a prior knowledge of how to open this one. So we have the opening and closing activity also. That means I'm telling them squeezing. So here, even though I have to do it silence, since it's hard for you to understand what I'm doing, I'm just going to tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to fill up each hole with the water. So you can imagine. So I, I have to fill up all these holes. It will take the whole another 10, 15 minutes, since we don't have the time, I'm going to stop. So once I fill up, it looks beautiful. And we make it little attractive, all the materials by making the color water. And after I do that, I have to appreciate my hard work. I'm not done yet. Let's see. And then I have to get the children. Uh, initially, sometimes I might give a group lesson, but most of this type of lesson, we do individual lessons one-on-one. -on -one. And then this time the challenge is this one out. 
So you can imagine each hole, I have to take the water, squeeze. And every lesson has also, we call this as a point of emphasis. I'm sorry. Unless I squeeze the water on well. And point of consciousness, I have to be very conscious to put this squeezer into the bottle, otherwise the water will spill. So as you see how much they're strangling that finger, fingers, and the hand and eye coordination and the concentration. And every materials also, we call it as a self-correcting, control of error. Happens, accident happens. If the water spills, we have a sponge. The child just cleans up the sponge. We teach them top to bottom, left to right. And after we are done, we stand up. Without making the noise. Hmm. I have to remember where I took the work from. Then, this is just one activity. So, any activity we do in the practical life area, this is how we do. Hmm. So, that's the primary movement. Uh, so the next area is our grace and courtesy that is not for me to show you here. So, Basically, that we teach the children, and the grace and courtesy helps the children to behave uh, properly in the school or the places. Or they learn the, the social skills. Uh, so, a few of the examples are like how to interrupt. For example, if I'm talking to Mr. Midland, she and the child will my attention. And children, most of the time, they misbehave, we call them as misbehave, uh, because they don't know how to. What to say, how to react. That's why they say, Mrs. Vajala, I need your help. Then we say, and the way we give them the lesson is we ask them to put their hand on our shoulder or on our hand somewhere. And then I take my hand and I, I put my hand on top of their hand so they know my physical touch is telling them that the kid, Mrs. Vajala, even though talking to Mr. Magnus, she knows I'm right there. So he's teaching them the patience at the same time teaching them how to interrupt. So that is just one of the activities we teach them, one of the lesson, how to observe someone. They are very curious if the child is doing a lesson, they want to do the same lesson, I want to observe. So we teach them how to observe. They keep their hand uh, to your, on your mm, lap and sit and watch and once you're, or sometimes you have to ask your friend, your friend may not want you to sit next to so may I watch your lesson? Please, thank you. All those things are uh, comes under the grace and courtesy. Actually, grace and courtesy is a very um, interesting uh, area because it's, sometimes it's cultural too. Um, for example, in another, like in Asia, we don't use please and thank you. So it's very hard and it's okay because it's just a given thing. Whereas here we have to say please and thank you. So in Maya Montessori, actually the, our, um, Montessori areas, grace and courtesy has a very vast, many, many, many activities. Even though we don't have anything on the shelf, interacting with socially, uh, we teach a lot, lot, lot of these children, and we ourselves also learn from other culture. So it's my favorite actually, grace and courtesy. And uh, so that's the second area. Third one is the care of the self. Um, so as I said before, they learn. Um, Independent living skills. Um, sorry, I have to walk again. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we every classroom has the dressing thing. Uh, it has like a button, the zipper, how to tie the shoelace, um, how to buckle. Also, so I'm going to show you. Yes, this is the simple how to button your shirt. We teach them so they can practice this one. This is the dressing frame, button dressing frame. Again, I said the name of the uh, activity, the name of this material is the button frame. First thing, this one has actually 17 steps. So, 
see all my hands. I'm just unbuttoning at this point. And again, I did top to bottom for my hands. And transfer through this also. Just at my hands. Basically, silently, I'm saying that this button will go into this hole. I'm just acting. I know I look stupid on here, but this is what I'm doing. So, I'm basically, I'm telling them four. I'll do it faster, but we do it when we give the lesson, we do it very slowly. So this is just one simple button framework. We have tying the shoelace. And this, this has actually 22 steps. So a lot of concentration that the child has to do. Uh, not all the children will be able to do it. Uh, so this is the basic one and this is the complex one. And on, besides that also we teach them how to uh, zip up the jacket, how to wear the jacket, how to take off their shoes when they come into the classroom, put their slippers on, take off their slippers. So all those things come from the care of this child. And the last area is the care of the environment. So through that activities, all the activities in the care of the environment, teach them the cleanliness. This is your classroom. We love to come into the neat and clean classroom. So every classroom has shelves with uh, uh, mopping, sweeping, tables, uh, mm, scrubbing work and all that. Um, one of the complex uh, work is the table scrubbing work. Uh, if I have to give this lesson, I think we'll stay here for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just show you exactly what we do. The first thing we do is Mm, today's work is going to be very interesting. Yesterday you did painting, the table got all bent. It's okay, we had so much fun. We have to clean up because today we are going to use this table to do something else. That's all. That's all my pitch. After that, I say, I'll quietly go to the shelf and say, this is very good work with me. And then I bend and get it. Mm, usually we keep it on the floor. It will be hard. For Mr. Madeline, she is standing and doing so. I'll just show you how we set up this one before even we give the lesson. A lot of work in work, so we need an apron. And we have to make sure that they know how to put an apron, how to roll and unroll the apron. This is a child size apron, so I have to act. Don't go, but when you do it, so we ask a child, I say, I'm going to show you how to wear, put on an apron and we show it on a child. And I say, since it does go, I just pretend I'm going to put it like this. And then we start the work. Mm -hmm. so. And then we say dry thing stays outside, wet thing stays wet. First, they, have, they need the soap, then the pitcher, then the bucket, then the brush, mm. then the sponge. All these things will be on the left hand side on the floor. This work is actually um, equivalent to writing a high school essay or a high school term paper. Because they have to think, what do I do? What do I do first in order to clean the table? So just like at the topic sentence. And then the middle, I have to do all this thing. And then the ending. So we call it as a high school term paper. Um, so once they do it, Mr. do you want me to show this one, the whole thing? Okay. Then what I'll do is now you know how to set. Oops. 
Now, because of the COVID, of course, we won't do that. Otherwise, we yes. here when we put the soap again, I see dark to dark. This is very good for the children for their gross motor skills. They are actually strengthening their back muscles also in this. Sometimes not all the letters are like straight, so they are like curvy. Basically, I'm cleaning the table, which was a little dirty. Putting the soap on there. Soap always stays dry. And at this point, the child will go to the sink, get the water, we say. Not up to the top. And this is again, the child have to hold the sprout here, the handle, and walk, and get the water, and then pour the water into the bucket. So that you can just put the soap and the pitcher, mm. and they have to scrub this table. So, the child will just because we don't want the water to drip all over. Uh, to bottom, but circular. Remember some letters like letter C, letter O, they are in a circular motion. So, this is again helping them with the preparation of holding a pencil, writing the letter, and the concentration and the process. Everything is involved in this particular activity. So, like this, half of the back, back, mm. with the sponge. Remember, they already got this lesson how to squeeze the sponge. How to squeeze the sponge. Sometimes they do play the soap shirt and they laugh, they laugh. Mm -hmm. Then again, do that. And so, all this process, the whole process takes about 20 to 25 minutes. And then we take the wash cloth. Again, like it's a hard task for the adults also. By the end of this, we also <laughs> we take a nice breath. We get tired sometimes by doing this. That is just the presentation. Remember the third cycle. Now we have to put this work back. Again, they have to go and throw the dirty water into the sink. Bring this one. And wipe it up. And then they have to put this work back. Everything will go into this again in sequence. First thing of this. So soap always stays dry. We're going to put the wet things into the bath. If that has water, it's wet. This got wet too. This got wet too. This one mm, does not go anywhere because this is dirty. So every classroom in the housekeeping area has a basket. All the dirty clothes goes there and the teacher takes it home and cleans it up. And then we bring another new washcloth and put it back because that is exactly how we took this work from the shelf. And this here. Here, and if the mat is wet, we use the sponge to clean, and then we roll. You see some roll, roll, roll your mat, roll it nice and tight. Don't forget to tap the end on the left and right. Mm -hmm. Remember, they already learned how to roll the dog. We'll double check everything is right. Last thing is the apron. Take the apron, same thing. 
and do it a little faster. And I took the lesson to do it slow. Again. That's the way I can explain that. Now this work is ready for our friend to practice. Then. So that's the care of the environment, the table scrubbing work. We have plenty of activities like that in our classroom. We go there. Uh, if the children are not using that materials, we bring the new materials. Um, I think I have covered all the four areas and I, I wish you were all here uh, to see. Um, but right now, I think if you have any questions or anything, Mr. Maglinsi and I would be happy to answer. Um, thank you. Oh my goodness. All right, let's see. Oh, there you go. Uh, do we have any questions for Mrs. Vichala or shall we just move right into um, our uh, next classroom? All right, I'm not seeing any uh, questions. I'm not. All right. So, uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Vichala. I'm going to turn off my camera and I'm going to bring this camera into the next room, which is the uh, Birch classroom with Katie Ottinger. I think uh, Lisa Cheslick is going to jump on there. I'm here. So, as Patrick mentioned, he's just going to turn off his, his, um, equipment there and walk over to the Birch classroom. So just we'll take just a minute or two um, and you will be greeted by our wonderful teacher, Katie, who's just been um, a great addition to our, our staff and really excited, really thankful that you guys all joined us tonight. And um, we look forward to, you know, chatting with you again at the end, if you have questions. So feel free to start maybe before she starts, maybe start writing some things down and um, you know, we'll be happy to answer them at the end. Perfect time. All right. All right, I think we're ready to go. Without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my good friend, Katie. Hi, everyone. Can you see me? Nice to be with all of you virtually tonight, and um, I really appreciate you taking time to be here. I know having young children that, you know, the whole bedtime routine, it can be exhausting. You fed your children, bathed your children, successfully gotten them to sleep, maybe, and now you're spending the time to learn about practical life and language, and I really appreciate that. Um, before I became a Montessori teacher, I worked in public schools and um, my background is in education and psychology. And um, I wondered, you know, if there was something more. And I found Montessori and totally fell in love with it. And I'm grateful that you're here to learn more about it and that you're taking a chance on Montessori for your child because I truly believe that it's a gift to each child. Um, and so I'm grateful to have them in my class and to spend time with them. Um, parents often ask me at conferences, when will my child learn to read and write? Um, I know it's, it's one of those huge milestones, like when will my child learn to talk? When will they learn to walk? It's such an exciting thing. It's, it's kind of that next big milestone for young children. And it's not the start of language. It's one of the first things that we really see as adults as being like, wow, 
they are reading and writing. This is so exciting that I can engage with them in this way. But there's so much more under the surface happening that needs to happen before you try to put a pencil in a child's hand. Um, so I just made a little pyramid for all of you. And I know you probably can't read this, but I'll go through it. And I'll explain why Montessori kind of helps us get through the stages of development for language. And a lot of other curriculums don't do that. Um, so before your child can have legible handwriting, they need to have body awareness. And um, as Prava was just showing us, a lot of practical life leads to body awareness, as the sensorial activities. We need movement. Children need touch. That's the foundation for handwriting. Then they need to work on their vision and hearing. Those things are next. Then balance, motor planning. So, oh, I need to move the rug. I know Prabhu was talking about the rug. Can they understand that they need to see? That's motor planning, making a plan with your movements. Um, stability, are they tripping over themselves? If they're tripping over themselves, holding a pencil and writing, it's going to be challenging for them. Um, strength and endurance. So at circle time, you know, at the beginning, of the year, children are kind of like falling over when they're sitting at circle. They're not being disruptive on purpose. They haven't, they don't have endurance and strength yet. So how can we develop strength and endurance so a child can sit and write? Um, visual atten attention, perception, and motor integration. So if a child is playing I spy, can you scan the page? Do you understand how to scan the page to look for something? Um, and then with motor integration, when I'm drawing a picture of a house, do I understand that the um, triangle goes on top of the square or is my triangle all the way up here? Um, manipulation, grasp and control, practical life really helps with those things, um, moving your hands, grabbing things, having really fine control with opening and closing things. All of those things come before a child can write. Letter formation and speed and endurance. So not only can they make the letter A, but can they make the letter A small enough to fit on a line? Do they understand where it goes on the piece of paper or are they putting it where the picture goes? All of those sorts of things. Can the eye match the hand? Um, and then can they do it for longer than two minutes or do they get fatigued? If they're getting fatigued, even though they can write, they're not ready to do long writing yet, even if we know that they can. And then when all of these pieces come into play, they can write. And that's the time that we really start to focus on that. Um, so I wanted to start with that because I know that that's something that all parents are excited for and want to see. But just like a child needs to roll over and they need to sit up and they need to creep and they need to crawl and they need to pull up, they need to do all of those things before they can walk. And I'm sure at home with your babies, you were giving them opportunities for all of these things. Three to six year olds also need a lot of support with their bodies. And that's what a Montessori curriculum does. Um, so I would love to share some of the materials that we have in our classroom that helps guide the child in developing control over their bodies so that they can read and write. Um, Dr. Montessori said, the only outwardly recognizable sign of the onset of the sensitive period for language is the child's smile. When a child walks into the classroom, we have our first language communication before we say anything at all. I get down at their level, I look them in the eyes and I smile and I say good morning. And they look back at me and they might not smile but we're having a moment together. That is language. When we're thinking about the sensitive period for language really begins right when the child is born. You know, the child is born and you hear that cry. And then the child has this time for about 10 minutes where they can really make contact with you and they're looking at you. That is all language. 
and the language has been going on for about 100,000 years. And there's about 3,000 to 8,000 documented languages currently. Um, first, it was pictures and then ideograms, hieroglyphics, and then it became alphabetic. And that's where we are right now. Um, and so there's a lot of different areas in our classroom. And so I'd like to talk about the different areas of the classroom and then end on language because they all kind of culminate together and become part of language. Um, so practical life, which is what you had the pleasure of hearing about today, always begins right, left to right, just like when you read, right? So a child learns to move it slowly left to right. And not only does that help develop concentration, coordination, independence, order, they're working on eye tracking. And if a child's going to learn how to read, they need to start looking at things in this way, left to right in an organized fashion. We also have a lot of activities that help children with their grasp. You might see with toddlers, they have, they hold everything like this. If they're holding a pencil, first it's like this, and then they kind of hold it like loosely in their hands like this. And then they kind of have it, they're almost there. And then it becomes the grasp that we're looking for with handwriting. These activities strengthen it. Twisting is really important for a child. You cannot learn to write if you're not able to twist something. And even if you don't have these Montessori activities at home, you have a lot of things in just your daily life. Your child's zippers, um, buttons, those sorts of things. So letting your children have the opportunities to practice with those things, believe it or not, helps them with handwriting later on. We also use precise language with children. And that's in grace and courtesy. We have a few rules in our classrooms as Montessori teachers. Language is always clearly and plainly spoken. We always give the child the right word and not the slang word unless it's explained as such. And as Montessori teachers, we're aware of cultural differences in this regard. So slang for one person might be an appropriate language for another person, and we educate ourselves on the differences. We don't limit our vocabulary to what we think the child will understand. That's baby talk. And a lot of adults use that language with babies and toddlers and young children. And actually, right from the moment a child is born, you can talk to them with grown-up language, they'll understand. We repeat words and commands often, directly, and as much as possible without anger. And actually, if you're at that point where you're feeling frustrated and angry, which as parents, we all get to that point because it's exhausting, it means you let the child get too far. They've pushed your boundaries and you didn't set a clear boundary. So the moment something feels uncomfortable to you, it's really respectful for you and for your child to let them know that that's not something that we do. Um, and on the same token, we let the child know what they can do. So if a child hits the cat, it's not don't hit the cat. That doesn't really tell them anything about what they can do. They don't understand what they can do. But you could say, this is how we pet the cat gently. And you can take their hand and gently pet the cat. We listen to the child carefully and patiently because a child can suffer linguistically and especially emotionally if they feel that no one understands them. We know that sarcasm and jest are not understood by young children. Say what you mean so they'll understand and know that anything you do in jest will be repeated by them. 
So if you are playing a game with your husband where you're like throwing popcorn at each other and trying to catch it into each other's mouths, which I don't know that any of you would be mm -hmm. doing that, know that your children are going to start trying to do that with each other and you're going to have popcorn all over the floor. So if it's a game that you don't necessarily want them doing at school, know that they do not understand that it's not appropriate if it's something being modeled. And notice when a child wants to converse, chatting beyond this can stifle a child's concentration. So if Prava is working really hard on a practical life work, this is not the time for me to go up to her and start talking away about her day or even saying, well, you're working so hard on that. She doesn't need that. She's already at a wonderful state of being. She's very calm. She's happy. She's focused. She's learning. That's not the time for me to interrupt her. If Prava was working hard on something and looks up at me and smiles and looks at it and looks at me, and clearly she wants me to tell her what that is, then that would be an appropriate time for me to give her the language and then step back. Order is also really important for language because if a room is untidy, it's distracting for a child. So you'll notice that Montessori classrooms are very neat and tidy because it's just one less distraction for a child. And they'll know where everything is, which is very helpful in leading to independence. Um, movement is also crucial to a child's language development. And you'll see with all of the materials that I show you, that they lead to optical movement. Everything we do, rolling out rugs, walking around the room, there isn't just, this is your seat and this is where you are. Children are expected to move around the room whenever they need to. And that's important for a child to be able to really learn and think. You'll also notice that everything that we use is concrete as possible. If we don't have an object, we have a picture for something because the more abstract something is, the harder it is for a child to grasp. Things like worksheets is not something that a young child should be doing. Maybe by the time they're five or six, when their body's really ready for that work, that's when we would start to give that work to them, but never before that. I'd like to show you some works that we have in the classroom for when children are unsure of how to participate in the day. We would talk about, thank you so much. We would talk about at Circle, different expectations for the room. Children are expected to clean up their work. And then there's a visual. Children roll rugs here. Children are calm in our classroom. But then there would be some other talking points. Is it easy to get work done if you're feeling tired, hungry, sad, or wild? It's very challenging to focus, and we know that as adults as well. So if a child is running around the room, you know, they're feeling out of control. My response wouldn't be, stop right now, that's inappropriate, you can't do that. My response would be, oh my, look at that. It looks like you need to move your body. Let's see if we can find something that is appropriate to do in the classroom. And I'd find something in the classroom that I felt like would work for them. And then later on at circle time, I might talk about you know, sometimes we feel like we need to shout or we feel like we need to move. Here are some things that we can do because we can't shout in the classroom. But, you know, in a non-COVID year, maybe we have um, a musical instrument like a flute. You know, maybe you need to blow something really hard and get some of that energy out. Um, so there's appropriate ways to do things and you're always modeling the appropriate way to do something as opposed to the inappropriate. All of our works in the classroom. Like 
help children understand how to talk to one another. And of course, in a microcosm of a preschool, just like in the real world with adults, there are conflicts. And, you know, I think when you're a parent of a three-year-old, it's really hard when a child comes home for the first time and says something like, no one would play with me on the playground today. Or um, at circle time, someone made fun of the way I said something. And they feel hurt and they don't know what to do with those feelings. So when your child comes home with a moment like that, please let the teacher know. Because if we haven't already talked with the child about it, we'd love the opportunity to. Because young children are all inherently good. And young children are all learning. Um, this is a piece, Rose. And children often make mistakes with each other, just as adults do. And the peace rose gives a child an opportunity to make amends. Um, so if a child yelled at another child and the child was hurt, they have the opportunity to say, I'm sorry I yelled. And the, child, the other child can accept the rose. This is all language. Instead of focusing on the problems, we're focusing on the solutions. We're giving children the ability to express the way they feel and really become peacemakers in the classroom. Thank you. In our sensorial curriculum, thank you. Children learn through their senses. Um, they learn about Um, so you have language here, but you're also working on your pencil grasp. And the more children use this grasp, the more capable they are of writing eventually. So there's so many different things and it's really simple work. They're learning about language, they're learning about gradation, and they're learning how to hold their hands so that they can May I have that Thank you so much. No, I, I'm so grateful that you're doing this. And in sensorial, children will get a three-part lesson, um, which is one of the first ways a child starts to learn language in the classroom. So I might say, this is a sphere. And then I might say, can you show me the sphere? And they point to it. And we'd stay on that second step of the three-part lesson for a long time. The third step is to say, what is this? But I would never ask a child what this is until I knew that they knew that this was a sphere. And by doing that, I'm respecting the child and helping them hold on to that love of learning. Because when we start quizzing children and, and trying to force them to come up with an answer before they're ready to, they start to feel stressed. So even at one and a half year, years old, when we start to say, what is this color? We're giving them that fear of being wrong. You know, So we always try to make sure the child knows the answer before we ever ask. Thank you. In our science area, we have a lot of animal works because the children love animals. This is a puzzle work that has been being used quite a bit lately. And not only do they work on the grass with these awesome pegs, and not only do they learn about spatial awareness, which is important for reading, they also learn about parts of the reptile. So a child who works on this would also trace the turtle, push pin the turtle, and I'll show you what push pinning is as well, and then label the parts of the turtle. 
So they're working on all sorts of different language. And again, you use correct language, right? Yes, and we use correct language. That's right. Thank you. In the math area, children also begin learning with language because like language, math uses words and symbols. So children learn that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is ten. This says ten. This is one. This says one. So math and language are very similar. And a child starts to learn that there's a word for many different and you can use different symbols to express these words. And now we come into our language curriculum. And our language curriculum starts very simple, just like our practical life exercises start very simply. So one of the first language exercises I might do with a child is I might just invite them to sit with me and show them this picture and say wow and the child will look at it and i'll say what do you think is happening here and the stories that i get this picture especially they really love i think the stern look of the father and perhaps the guilty face of the child is very interesting to them and i get a lot of stories today i heard that this child ate all of the cookies and the father is telling him that they're going to need to take a time out. And every child comes up with a slightly different story and it's, you know, they're understanding that the way people express themselves, there's a story behind it. If someone has a furrowed brow, there's a reason why they might be upset. And so they're understanding body cues, but then they're also able to create these stories. We also have I Spy books and I Spy games. And these books are fantastic because of visual tracking. Being able to find something specific in a book is really important to being able to understand when they're going to write how to put letters on a line. Um, so this is where it begins. And then a child might be interested in learning some sounds of some letters. <clears throat> so just like with the three period lesson that I showed you with the sensorial materials, like the sphere, I might show them this and say, hmm. And then eventually, can you show me mm, after I've showed all these letters and these, can you find mm? And when I know that they've mastered it, I'll say, what is this? And they'll say, hmm. And Montessorians typically like to introduce the letter, letter sound before the letter name. Although a lot of children come in knowing a lot of the letter names already. And once they've mastered this, they might start to match objects with initial sounds. Apple, a, ah, a, ah, apple. And again, it's concrete. This is really exciting for a child. This work is so loved in the classroom. And then when they know all of their letter sounds and you know that they know them all, maybe they want to begin creating some words. And you'd start with CBC words like that, the at. This is a movable alphabet, and the movable alphabet is my favorite Montessori work. And the reason I love the movable alphabet is 
I was a kindergarten teacher in a public school before I worked as a Montessori teacher. And children would become so frustrated when it was time for them to learn how to write because coming up with a sound in your mind and then having the motor planning to make the letter on paper is incredibly frustrating for a young child who is learning to write. Having something like this where they can find mm, find a, oh, I'm spelling the wrong word here. <laughs> Find the, find a, find t, and then write it is much more appealing to a child. And it cuts down on the frustration. And that's what we always want to intend to do because if a child is starting to feel frustrated with learning, you're losing them. And we want a child to be excited every time they come to school and every time they learn so that they're lifelong learners. This might be a good time to start teaching children sight words as well. There are some words that you just can't sound, sound out and you have to memorize. So every day we'd go over these until they have them all down. And then maybe they'd like to start building some sentences. And this is fun for the children. We always want them to feel like they're playing. Put the gum in the bag. I have all of these objects and I have to do it. Put the gum in the bag. And this is a great way to maybe involve a three-year-old with, like if a three-year-old's really interested in the language works and all of these little materials, but they're not quite ready to read. Maybe they'd want to sit with the kindergartner, and the kindergartner could read this to them, and then the three year old could do it. And then the three year old's working on language, they're taking in the information, they're creating the sentence. So it's a win win for both, and language development for both. After children have their sight words and they have their understanding of sounds, initial sounds. We might want to start teaching um, various rules that kind of don't fit in with regular sounds. So the magic E rule. The magic E has um, a vowel, a constant, and a vowel. And we teach the children that E goes around the constant and kicks the I and makes it say its name. So instead of saying eh, it says I because it's so frustrated that it got kicked. And then the child would know to match the object with the word. So it's fun. And there's a lot of rules. If you look over here, there's a lot of little boxes. But because there are little objects to do it with, it's fun for the children. They feel like they're playing. And there might be a three-year-old next to them who's really interested in the little objects, so they're picking up on it as it goes. And then when they start to learn their little rules, you do the same thing. The chick pecks at a chip, and they can find the objects, and they can make the objects do it. And just looking at these, you know, there's the ch rule and the sh rule and the double O makes oo rule. There's so many rules. It's a lot of work for these young children. It's amazing that they can come in here as three-year-olds and, you know, don't know any letters in the alphabet. And then they leave as kindergartners and many of them are learning these rules or have mastered many of these rules. It's such an explosion of language. And of course, we have lots of readers in the classroom. These are some of the favorites because they're simple and children can read this, you know, just by learning a few sight words. And in this one, it's just the sounds k and d that they're working on. So you don't even need to know all the sounds to be able to read a book like this. So there's just a lot of incentive for children and they're very excited. And then it's time to write. So of course they're starting to learn 
how to make the letter k C. And when we teach them how to feel it, and we're showing them what it feels like because their hands are so sensitive to touch, as we talked about in the pyramid, it's so important. We show them that it starts at the top and it goes down. And then we might bring them to a sandbox and have them make the letter themselves. We do this before we'd ever give them paper. They're also developing their hands with push pinning. You might be coming home with lots of little papers with all these little prick marks, but this is developing the hand and they have to stay on the line. So again, it's that focus and the eye control of understanding where to put it. And that will help them with reading and writing. Where are the letters? Follow the line. And I think that a lot of people don't know that children need to be able to do a lot of things with their bodies before they can write. So they need to be able to move their hands like this. So scissors are really important to use at home even though it's a lot of work and it's hard because you have to sit right there at first. Same with glue, you know, pulling off a cap, knowing where to put the glue, putting the piece down, all of that is motor planning. Things like twisting, all of those things are needed, that body integration, before you would expect a child to hold a pencil. Here's another one of my favorite things. These are metal insets. Around we go. When children use the metal insets, they're learning all the different ways to move the pencil to make letters. This shape can help with the letter C with the letter A with the letter G with the letter D with the letter B. And we have lots of metal inset shapes that show different types of lines and curves, all of which are needed for writing. And it also leads to coordination, concentration, independence, and order. Right now, my kindergartners are working on date pages. So this child, wow, is working so hard. Today is Monday, January 3rd, 2022. Being able to make the letters correctly and in the lines is such hard work. This child was so proud of themselves after they accomplished this work. And then they'd be able to start writing sentences of their own with complex thoughts. And writing starts early at first. You might have a three-year-old who's starting to draw pictures. They might say, they might draw this and say, this is my house. And then they might do this. This is my house. That's the next step. And then they might do this. This is my house. They're saying that that's what it says. Okay, that's right. They are learning that letters symbolize something. This is part of writing. So if a child does this at your house, well done. They are not wrong. They are learning. Then they might write this. This. TH sometimes sounds like F to children. Is, S is the primary sound that they're thinking, my mm, house. They're getting there. They're starting to think about the initial sounds that they're hearing. And then they might write this. They're getting there. 
then they start to learn every word has they learned the rule that you always need a vowel on every word. And then all of a sudden, they write something like this. It's not all correct, but they're getting there. That's the progression of writing for a child. It starts with a picture, and then it's scribbling, and then it's random letters, and then it's the initial sounds they hear, and then they start to get closer and closer to the real word. I would not correct this. If I had taught them the magic E rule, then I might say, oh, there's that magic E. But if I hadn't taught a rule, I would never tell them that that was incorrect because they got every sound and shouldn't they be so proud? As a children, if the child moves through our curriculum, they start to learn parts of speech and trickier concepts. And not every child gets, gets there by the end of kindergarten. And for a lot of children, that's a big work for first grade. So I'm not going to go into that as much. Um, I think it's so important for parents to know all of the things that come into play before a child is able to read and write. And I hope that you learned a lot tonight. Thank you so much for being with me. Uh, we do seem to have, uh, you have, it says, let's see, I'm sorry. Says you have one question in chat. I don't see it. I can. Would you like me to read it, Patrick? Yes, please, if you have it. Okay. Um, so it says Children's House contains varied ages of kids. How does the program make sure that the kids, regardless of age, are being included in various activities and have a healthy connection or healthy interaction? me to answer that one. That'd be great if you feel comfortable. Um, I think it is such a gift to have various ages in one classroom. Um, kind of like in a family home if you have more than one child. You know, you have your firstborn, maybe you have a middle child, maybe you have the youngest, and they all have different roles in the house. In the Montessori classroom, they get to be the oldest child, they get to be the youngest child, they get to be the middle child. So they get to be a leader. They get to show people how to do things. How exciting is it for a five and six year old to be able to sit with a three year old and show them something? You know, they get to kind of feel like teachers. Three year olds have all of these people in the classroom that are just willing to dote on them and spend time with them. They're kind of the babies of the room. And of course, they're not babies. You know, we have talked about this work, the chip, half set of chip, and the kindergartner might be reading the sentence and the three-year-old might be making the sentence. So they're both involved. The three-year-old feels so special to be sitting with the kindergartner. The kindergartner feels so good to be leading this. And the middle child gets to mediate all of these moments. We know that the middle child tends to be problem solvers, conflict adverse, you know? Um, so in the Montessori classroom, they get to wear all of these hats and they're learning foundational skills that they might not get in a traditional home because they don't get to be the baby of the family, the middle child and the oldest child. Um, so I think it's a gift. And it was something that I wondered about and worried about walking into my first Montessori classroom. By day three, I thought, oh, why, why do we ever break up children my age? I'd like to thank uh, Katie and Prabha for doing such a wonderful job tonight. One of the things I love about our community, <laughs> one of the things I love about our community is that we are so passionate about what we do. I think it comes out when we start talking about it. 
when we start talking about parent education, what we're trying to do is show you a little something that goes on in our classrooms. So you have a reference point. So when you get pictures in, uh, in, in a transparent classroom, you'll be able to say, oh yes, I remember. I remember them talking about push pinning or, oh my goodness, look, my child is washing that table. I think Mrs. Vachala referred to it as the essay, the high school essay. That is a really interesting work that is so exciting. The beauty of Montessori, in my opinion, and I do say this from a very uh, personal area because my children have gone through the school and, and I was a teacher in the classroom. There is so much happiness and so much learning going on every day. It is a joy to come into classroom and teach and be with your children. It's never easy because it's a tough, demanding job, but it is so joyful and we all enjoy it. And that is why we're here. And that joy is spread from your children to us and right back that other way. And we've really enjoyed it. So thank you for sending your children here. We are so excited that they are part of the community. I wish we were able to do this earlier in the year, but you know, Life is life, right? We just gotta go with what we got. So thank you all so much for coming. We have recorded this as I was telling people right when we started, we have recorded it. And Lisa and I will make sure it's available for families if you had to leave in the middle or whatever the case may be, or maybe you weren't able to stay for the whole time, that's perfectly fine. But again, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Papa. I greatly enjoyed our evening. Have a wonderful night, and we'll see your kids soon. Thank you.